Welcome to our fall boot camp. We have not done this since the fall of 2019 in person. So we're excited to be here with you today. It is so fun to see your faces. It feels different. Um, normally, we're doing this over webinars, and we're just looking into a camera. And believe it or not, that's just not the same. So we're excited to have you here. There are three things that we'll cover today. One, a portfolio manager's view on the US markets and that will be Nate Reese. Two, we're gonna talk about tax changes coming in 2026. I'll cover that. My name is Zach Call. I'm the president of Capita Financial Network. And then the third one is, is Tim Holland will be doing um, the US dollar and how to really be thinking about the US economy with regard to the US dollar. So let's get your presentation going. So Nate Reese is a portfolio, well, he works for the team at Alta Capital. So he's a principal at Alta Capital and Alta is a local investment manager that focuses on high quality stocks. Um, they tend to be somewhat concentrated. I'm telling you about what we think about Alta. Nate's gonna cover other stuff, but um, there you go with that. Awesome. Um, so Nate, Nate's company, we like that they think about the stocks in terms of not being overly diversified. That's a common theme. We either think you should be extremely diversified and low cost index funds, or you should own fewer stocks and be semi-concentrated, but don't pay active management fees and funds and then look like an index fund. So we like that Alta does not look like an index fund. We're not against, we actually use index funds too. The point is, be on both sides, don't get caught in that expensive middle. Um, let's do the first raffle and then Nate will tell us a little bit about his, um, his thoughts on US markets. The plan today, this is an educational event. So. I wanna spend part of the time talking about historical data. What has worked in investing over the last 40 years? What are those key attributes? You can see the title here, Hall of Fame attributes among athletes and investors, and I'll, I'll explain. And then we're gonna talk about today, right now, what are we seeing, what are we most focused on as a group of portfolio managers, the investment committee at our shop. But we're gonna have a little bit of fun, we're gonna do a little trivia, I kinda of blew it, Kind of pop the slide up there so people saw this. The first one's super easy. Be ready, hit the buzzer. I've got a little uh, sleeve of golf balls to hand out at the end. So Bart, you're in charge. You're gonna tell me who wins, who goes first, all right? And then we're gonna talk about why I'm showing these athletes. So who's this? Okay, who was first? You gotta raise your hand. Okay, right here. Or somebody, okay, Bart. I'm sorry, this could be, this could be trouble. All right, John Stockton. Why was he a Hall of Famer? What did he do well? Assists, okay, he's known for this, right? He leads the NBA all time in assists. Does anyone know how many? This would be like extra, but like I'd buy you a house. <laughs> Ooh, you're, you're, you're on another stat there. So, so it's 15,806, which is crazy for how many years he played. Does anyone know who is second all time in assists? You gotta yell it. Ooh, magic, good guess, no. Stockton passed him, but someone else ended up passing him. It's Jason Kidd. And the reason I bring that up is he's right around 12,000. So the gap between number one and two is huge. Stockton was so steady at distributing the ball and creating scoring. What else did he do really well? Steals. There's a stat over here, it steals. Okay, again, number one by a long shot. Okay, he's a two-time Olympic medalist, consistent all-star, amazing. But when we talk about the 30 best players in basketball, does his name come up? Pretty rare, pretty rare. Who's this? This is getting a little tougher. Ooh, nice, Chris Everett, okay? Little lesson too, I've always thought it was Everett, it's Everett, no one knows that. Anyway, Chris Everett. So, what was special about her? She won 157 titles. That's 157 tournaments that she won. Six straight years of never losing on clay. 13 straight years of winning at least one major. But most importantly, a 90% winning percentage. That's number one among women and men in tennis. Unbelievably successful. But if you talk about the best women tennis players, she generally doesn't come up in the top three. Last one, this one's really tough. If you get this, I'm impressed. We're going back to the 80s here. Tim might know it. Tim does know it. Anybody else? All right, Tim. Uh, I'm gonna go with Anthony Munoz. 
That is correct. Anthony Munoz. This is a left tackle. That is boring, right? Well, pretty amazing. 185 games started out of 186 possible. He only missed one game. 11 consecutive All-Pro nominations. So, of, of those 11 years, he was considered one of the top two left tackles in football. Consistent. But the craziest stat ever, how many sacks did he give up? So he's trying to make sure the, the defensive pass rusher doesn't get to the quarterback. How many sacks in all those years? Three, five, zero. Not one time, oh, did you say zero? Not one time did he allow somebody to get the quarterback, which is absurd. Okay, so why do I bring these athletes into the mix? What's, what's the message here with all three of these? Dedication, consistency, right? Doing something really, really well. It's not Michael Jordan and Babe Ruth that I'm talking about. These are all Hall of Famers. So the question is, what are the Hall of Fame attributes among companies that we invest in? What matters most? And I'm gonna show you a little alphabet soup here. There are 118 factors that investment managers use to determine which stocks to buy. This is just a subset of those 118, just to give you an idea of how ridiculous it is. But of all of these, which ones actually matter? So we went to Piper Sandler, this great research group out of New York, and we asked them, can you go back to 1985, all the way through the end of 2022 last year, and tell us of those 118 factors, which five actually made the difference? And for any business owner, this won't surprise you. Number one was free cash flow. And the numbers you're seeing here that look absurd, by the way, is taking the top quintile of companies versus the bottom quintile. So you're taking the S&P 500, taking the top 100 companies in terms of cash flow metrics versus the bottom. And then what's the difference in performance over those almost 40 years? Cash flow, number one. Why? That's the lifeblood. That's what you can reinvest back into the business. Which brings us to number two, return on invested capital. So when a company makes money, they should take that and reinvest in the business, whether that's in equipment, technology, R&D, right, launching new product. What's the return they get on that investment? Then you have interest coverage. Okay? We hate debt. We don't want debt with our companies. But for those who need a little bit of debt to operate, how well can they manage that debt? Or does the debt, you know, is that the tail that wags the dog? You've got to be very careful with that. And the last two, Return on equity and margins, these are measures of profitability. So when you look to buy stocks, what you care about is growth. You want your account to grow. Well, that happens by growing earnings. And we're gonna talk about this a little bit more in a minute. But growth without profitability is dead. You have to have the profitability for it to work. So those are the top five out of 118. And that looks really good on paper, but does it actually work in the real world. And here's an example. Does anyone know the company Amphenol? This is a little hidden gem. We've got somebody that knows Amphenol. Do you know what they do or what they make? That's amazing. No one's ever gotten this. That's incredible. I need to give golf balls to this. What's your name? Mike. Mike. Okay, so they make connectors. So if you take cables, like the cable you connect your TV to the wall, those little brass connectors on the end, Amphenol. Or if you take your phone and you look at the uh, little charge port here, okay, Apple might make the phone, but that charge port is made by Amphenol. It's all sorts of electronic connectors in the automotive space, aerospace, and, and just industrial space. Just an incredible business, but very few know about it. Well, these metrics at the bottom, if you can see them, and sorry if that's a little small up top, but in all five of what I call those Hall of Fame investment factors, they have numbers that are 50% better, or, or much more so, than the S&P 500 broadly. Point here is, if you can execute in all five of those, your chance of success is pretty good. In this case, since 2007, you have Amphenol up almost 1,000% in the S&P 360 and change. Okay, so that's historical, great. What about right now? What's happening today? And if you take the market through September 30, Keep in mind, October was crummy and November's been off the charts amazing, right? So we've had some craziness the last few months. But through September 30, the S&P 500 was up 13%. That's pretty good. It's a pretty good year. But what's interesting is 493 of those 500 companies collectively were up just 
And here's the data, and this might be a little tough to see, but you can see here at the bottom right, 493 companies up 2%. What won the day were these seven businesses, Apple, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, NVIDIA, Tesla, and Meta, formerly known as Facebook. Those seven companies made up, in essence, 85% of the market's return through September. And that's why we say thin market. That's not the kind of market that we feel really comfortable with. It's just a few companies doing the job. So what does that mean for now? What does that mean we should be concerned about? And this is what I want to just discuss for a minute. As portfolio managers, as an investment committee, what are the questions we are asking today with this as a backdrop and with those historical Hall of Fame metrics as a backdrop? And I'm sorry, a lot of words here, but I'll just talk through this quickly. This is what we are most focused on. In the last 18 months, companies have been able to kind of juice their earnings numbers because inflation has allowed them to raise prices. Take going to the grocery store, take PepsiCo, great business, love it. They own Doritos. A bag of Doritos was $2.99, what is it now? Right, $3.99, $4.99, whatever. So they've been able to take their earnings and even though the input costs were higher, they've been able to juice the price by much more than that. So you get a much better earnings picture. The question we are asking is, can that continue? Is it possible to continue, or do we get, end up with an earnings recession? The second one, all these companies that were taking on debt to operate their business, no cost, 1%, 2%, 3% kind of loans, or issuing bonds at those type of, of rates. Now things have changed. Rates are much higher, so can these companies roll over that low-cost low debt into this higher-cost debt and manage their margins and continue to succeed? That you need to be very, very, very careful with right now. The third point, the big keep getting bigger. So the question is, can you find some of these mid-sized companies, the Amphenols of the world, that are doing excellent things and gaining market share without having just to chase those big winners? that have done so much of the work the last five years. And these last two points, I'll just kind of put together. Until 2023, if you take 2017 through 2022, what worked was sentiment, emotion, excitement. Okay, take the Pelotons of the world, right? There was so much hopes and dreams for, for what a company might one day be able to do. What thankfully has changed in 2023, and we believe for the next three to five years, is it's now about the fundamentals. It is actually now about those Hall of Fame factors. That's what matters, and we're seeing that play out this year. So these are the things we're thinking about. What are we focusing on? And it's, all of these are important, but it's the bolded items that we're most focused on. And I'll start sounding like a, you know, I'm, I'm beating a dead horse here, but sustainable earnings per share. Can you continue to grow your earnings regardless of the environment? Recession, yes. Recession, no. Don't care, right? Political environment, the right, the left, don't care. No matter what's happening in the world, can the company that you invest in, can it do what it's expected to do and sustain those earnings? That's so big right now. And I'll tell you what, three years ago, if I was on stage talking to a group saying that, I'm putting people to sleep. No one wanted to hear that, that's boring. Well, right now, it's the hottest thing out there. Okay, that's what we're looking for. Competitive moat. You think about the old castles with that moat and the bridge, right? We want deep, wide moats, meaning you don't have other competitors taking away market share. We want our companies that we invest in to be gaining market share. And lastly, low leverage. We've already talked about that. Debt will kill you here. So let's take a look at a couple of examples. Current day. Adobe. Most everyone knows Adobe. Okay, Adobe Acrobat, you open up a PDF known very well for their creative space, Photoshop, Illustrator, et cetera. Love this business. If you look at the bottom right corner, look at these metrics, 30 plus percent in margins, ROIC, ROE, that's ridiculous. The market is single digits in all of those. That's pretty amazing. But what the chart shows you is this. The green line represents earnings per share. That is the earnings growth of that business dating back to 2002. The blue line is the price of the stock. What do you notice up until the last few years? They mirror each other. Price follows earnings. Okay, if you can turn off CNBC and never watch it again, congratulations, because you don't need to listen to it. That's the lesson, this is 101. 
Price follows earnings, up and down. Well, what happened when the Fed started raising rates aggressively is that you found great businesses see their stock price just fall off a cliff. But look at the green line. You see any hiccups there? It's unbelievable strength in earnings. And so what that provided for us, this is where we get excited. This is where the nerds get excited. You get this big drop, and you can go in and bottom tick that and add a great company like Adobe on the cheap and then get this awesome comeback. And it still has a little ways to go. But that's an awesome opportunity. And if we look at a current company now where that gap hasn't been closed, you all know Lowe's. This is one we're excited about right now. You see that earnings growth, it's kind of plateaued a little bit, but still a significant gap to where the current price of the stock is. And these, just so you know, these charts are as of October 30. So the market's ripped a little bit. So to close this up, I'm going to summarize here. This is what we're focused on, more than ever. And I don't mean, this, is, this isn't hyperbole here. Really, truly, 42 years of history at Alta. We just had this meeting about three weeks ago. More than ever, we're concerned about durability of earnings. We've already hit that, okay? I won't drive that home anymore. Durability of earnings, clear runway to expand market share. Are you able to grow that? Fundamentals versus emotion. Put the emotion aside. Put all that exciting stuff aside. Are the metrics telling you this is the right business? Let the metrics show it. Let those Hall of Fame factors come out, okay? Let's see the assists from Stockton. Okay, cash flow is cool. <laughs> Leverage is not. Leverage was really cool the last five years when the cost of debt was nothing. That's no longer where you want to be. And to close it, I would just say, you have to see demonstrated strength in every one of those five factors. Not in two, not in three, but in all five of those. And if you have those, a stock is going to move like this. It's going to be up and down. But over a five-year, 10-year, 15-year window, that's how you win. So with that, let's pivot to Q&A. Because most of the questions I got were actually for Capita. So I'm happy yeah, to answer that's those. That's great. That's great. But if, if you have any questions for Nate specifically, scan that QR code and throw it in there. Um, but I think what I'll do is I'll tackle some of the Capita yeah. questions first. That's perfect. Does that sound okay? Yeah. Um, what protects our money from being swindled by an employee of Capita? You guys are direct, huh? Uh, that's fair. And that's a tough one because uh, it seems like more and more our information is being handled. I don't know if it's carelessly or carefully, but it's just being handled more and more. Our information is out there more and more, and so it makes it more difficult. Um, the primary defense that you have is that we don't hold any of your money. So that makes it really hard for somebody at Capita to touch your money, because we don't actually hold any of it. So that's important for you to understand. Bernie Madoff's firm was the custodian and the investment advisor firm. They made up statements as the custodian and issued those statements to their investors, while the investment advisors made decisions as to what to do with those funds. We believe that commingling the relationship of your investment advisor and your custodian is dangerous. And we try our very, very best to not touch your money. And the closest we come to it is taking a rollover check from you and depositing it at your custodian for you. So, or taking a check from you that you want. And so we've had people actually try to bring cash in. We just can't even touch it. We can't take it. We have rules against it. So the only way for you to get money out of your account is for you to authorize on your portfolio. And right now, it's, we used to say we don't really care between TD and Schwab because we liked both custodians and we had assets of our clients at both custodians. But of course, they merged, so everybody's now with Schwab. Um, so in order for you to get money out of your Schwab account, you need to set up a link to your bank account authorized through paperwork on your Schwab profile. That type of action on your account generates automated alerts from Schwab to you. Any type of change of email, phone number, um, bank information as we mentioned, those are all now being reported to you independently from your custodian. So this is, this is a good relationship, we believe, for us to just be what's considered limited, limited authorization on your account to be able to do basically two main things, and it's to trade the portfolio, service it by giving you the forms that you need, and I guess that would be the second, and the third one is we do fee bill from the portfolios, that's it. So that's one of your primary ways of being protected. The other way is that we are extremely selective as to who we hire and passionate about it.
So, and I know that's somewhat lip service, but um, if you know the people at Capita, you know that that's a big difference, and you know the people that work there. So, um, I know a lot of people that work in the industry, but I only, like, the Capita job is a pretty selective job, and I'm super selective with who I hire. I do about half the hiring at the firm, Cassie does the other half. And so we're, we're super selective with who we bring on. And then on top of that, we are what's called an ensemble practice. We are not a platform or a registered investment advisor firm. That's also important to understand. A platform registered investment advisor firm says, hey, any advisor out there, we're good. You just hook up to us and you can use our back office. We've got great systems. We could actually make a lot of money being a platform RIA, registered investment advisor firm. We're not willing to do that in that structure because what Capita means to Capita, to what the name means to Capita is more than just trying to make profits. The name is an experience. It is uh, uh, like we can't have people using our name and not delivering good tax planning and not delivering good cash flow planning and good social security advice. Like our brand is something special that is um, controlled. So in other words, that also helps us know who is on platform and who's acting. And anyway, so that's, that's probably enough. I think your biggest defense is, um, is not being custodians of your money. And then the next thing is, does Capita still focus on controlling fees through the changes in managers and companies? I think you're talking about the TD Schwab merger. And if so, abs I mean, absolutely. The, the two firms were so incredibly similar. We've used them both for years and haven't seen any differences. In fact, if you guys want a, a story, I mean, Schwab did a really, really great chess game when they came in and, and kind of found out a way to make money where TD couldn't make money. They tried to buy TD, TD says no. They came in and said, great, we'll lower our commissions down to zero on trading stocks. TD made their money on commissions trading stocks and then they had to go to zero, and then it put them in an unequal playing field, and then Schwab said, how about now? And then they bought TD. So that was, that was a really like, interesting game of chess if you were watching it from afar. Um, but they're basically, I tell you that just because it's interesting to me, but they're basically the same in cost. We haven't seen any differences. Um, we're considering another, a third custodian. We like giving our clients choices, so we're considering another custodian, but I've been researching that for a year now, and we're patient on that to make sure that we, we know that they will be similar in cost to Schwab is, and Schwab, we think, is the leader in terms of technology and cost and speed of service. Um, Alta Capital is a relationship between Capita and Alta Capital. Um, Capita uses a firm called Town Square Capital. Town Square is also Orion. They're one. So a little bit of a soup here, but I'm going to get you through it, okay? So Orion is what's called an Outsourced Chief Investment Officer, OCIO. Tim is the OCIO. He's the leader of the Orion firm that we use. What they do is they take thousands of money managers out there, and our philosophy aligns with what Tim and his team does. Low cost, low turnover, semi-concentrated, not very tactical. We don't want people guessing where the market's going to go like crazy. So we found a firm that aligns with our philosophy. Then we, we have them narrow down thousands of portfolio managers to 30 or so, 30 to 50, depending on what you classify, but 30 or 50 different strategies that fit that philosophy and make that more manageable for a financial advisor to be able to piece those portfolios together. Alta Capital is one of those. It's, it's really up to about 80 strategies, but 30 individual managers that buy individual stocks like Alta Capital does. So they're one of 30 strategies, not all like Alta. Alta is a large cap growth to large cap core manager. We have large value, we have dividend payers, we have small companies, we have international, we have bond ladders and bond portfolios. So the different managers all specialize in their thing and we'll take some money from that a client wants to invest and we basically, in, and, and by the way, this, let me just give you an example of mutual funds, okay? So we have, there's another company like Alta that they run their strategy like Alta, tell us, meaning they tell us what stocks to buy. They also use that same information and buy, and they put it in their mutual fund. In their mutual fund, they charge 1.3% to all of the investors that go buy their mutual fund off the street. So you can get those same 25 stocks in the mutual fund paying 1.3% shaved off the share price throughout the year. Or we buy their trade signals for much less than that out of the fee that you pay us. 
and you get a financial advisor for a very similar cost and their direct trade signals. And by the way, we compared their fund against us just buying their stocks, and there was an over 2% difference in performance. The other 0.7 plus percent is attributed to cash management. They have to keep too much cash on hand because other people are buying and selling the fund unnecessarily. So instead of sending your money to the fund, we say, Alta, we love what you do. We're not going to give our clients money to you. Why don't you just tell us exactly what you buy anytime you buy it, and we'll buy those 20 or 30 stocks in your portfolio. That's the relationship between companies like Alta Capital and Capita. So hopefully that gives you an idea on how that works. Okay, so, and I'm going to get into my presentation in here a minute, but let's, um, I'm probably not going to go into a ton of, there was a rate of return question. I probably won't hit that because it's so varied. We have clients making two, three, and 4% and clients making, you know, eight, nine, 10 plus on averages, but it depends on your risk and your preference and what year and, and all those things. So I, I probably am not going to get into a uh, matrix on that. Somebody asked if Capita is a fiduciary. Capita is a fiduciary, but please, please, please do not use that as your measuring stick. Um, that is one of the mistakes that we see a lot. People will come um, and ask us about, are you a fiduciary? Because they know they're supposed to ask that question. That's great. A fiduciary is supposed to put your interests above their own when they give you recommendations, right? Um, but there's no way to eliminate all possible conflicts of interest. We manage money for a living. So there's a conflict there a little bit, right? I mean, we, we hope that you trust us enough to manage more of your money. So you need to take a second measuring stick. They need to be a fiduciary first, and then you need to get a feel for how well do they manage conflicts of interest. How well, how excited are they for you when you decide it's time to buy that second home and pull out $500,000 from the portfolio? Like, how excited are they for you as a client when that needs to be done? That's, that's another measurement that I think should be put into the equation. And, and, and so how well do they manage conflicts of interest? And I've met some really great financial advisors who manage conflicts of interest really well who are not technical fiduciaries like we are. So, so make sure that you, you think about both as you, as you think about your advisory firm. Hopefully that those things are helpful. Um, private equity, in, I'll probably not get into that, that right now. Um, Nate, you got a question. Um, let's do this and then I'll, I'll jump into my presentation. You talked about the upside, but what do you see as downside risk? Okay, so uh, can you hear me now? I turn that back on. So uh, the downside, the biggest concern, and I'll make this quick so we can keep this rolling and then we can talk afterwards too. It's that earnings recession piece I had. And I told you I don't care, a hard landing recession, soft landing recession, doesn't matter. Do earnings roll over? And do you see a, a recession in earnings? That is what concerns me. And the way you could get there, you know, really the big concern right now is unemployment, which is awesome right now. There is no unemployment, especially here in Utah, but nationwide it's incredible. We're starting to see those numbers tick up a little bit, and I think we're gonna be just fine. And if unemployment goes up to four and a half or five percent, from an economic standpoint, that's just fine. It's when you cross that five and a half mark. And so we're keeping a close eye on that. If we get there because there are earnings challenges and companies are starting to lay off, and that then puts you in a difficult position. So if there's anything that keeps me up at night, it's that. I, I'm very careful not to get caught up in uh, politics because laughably whatever you think will work with a Republican ends up going down and what you think will work or not work with a Democrat goes up. It, it just, it doesn't matter. It, it just comes down to how the companies are executing. So we'll put that to the side as much as it's hard for us to do so. It comes down to the nuts and bolts, earnings, unemployment, and now the inflation print today was so good, relatively speaking, it looks like we might be past that serious pain of inflation, especially when it came to food and energy, which is what we spend a lot of our money on. That's why the market took off today. For anyone who saw, the market was up huge today, and it was just because of that. So, yeah, I, I, I would say that's what's keeping me up at night, Zach. That, that's what could take things down, unemployment getting out of hand, and we're far from that right now. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Um, my part is taxes. So taxes are changing for you a bit. Um, in, so we're going to talk about, that's close. We're going to talk about how the taxes work in general. You have to understand your tax bill a little bit, just how it's calculated right now to understand what's changing. So we're going to work on that a little bit. Um, the change is why, when, and what, and what do you do about it? So that's, that's the agenda for today. Okay. So how do you taxes work? Um, it's, 
it's really funny to me. It feels really complicated when you look at the 1040 and all the lines, but it's not too bad. Okay, so basically you add all of your income. That's work income, social security, IRA withdrawals. And by the way, social security, a nice part about that is that it's not all taxed when it comes back to you. Some people get a lot of tax, a lot of their social security back tax free. Um, IRA withdrawals, just all your income, you add it all up. And then the adjusted gross income is called the line. That's important, the line. Certain ways of reducing your income happen above the line, and certain reductions happen below the line, okay? So those are those two orange, orange buckets there, right, or orange, orange circles. So above the line deductions, below the line deductions. If you ever hear that terminology, they're talking about, do I get to reduce my income before my adjusted gross income, or is it reducing my income after adjusted gross income? And so you're subtracting in both cases, but they're not equal because the line is important. Medicare premiums based on the line, not on taxable income. That's one example. A lot of things get based on some version of adjusted gross income, and they call it modified adjusted gross income or MAGI. Okay, so some of the things that you see above the line are HSA and IRA deductions and educator expenses and alimony paid and things like that. Um, the three big deductions below the line, in fact, I can usually ask those three questions and have a really good feel for whether you take a standard deduction or an itemized deduction. Do you give to charities? Do you have mortgage? And what is your state and local income tax? That's it. The other, a lot of the other deductions, they're actually what they call tier two deductions, where it has to exceed 2% of the line before you even get to add it below the line as a deduction. So, so most of the, a lot of the other ones are a little more complex and they're a step away. Those are your top three right there, and, they're, and that really is what matters. That's what you can control. So the way that taxes work is they, they go through that process, they take your taxable income and they start pouring it into the 10% bucket. And, any, and then basically that 10% bucket is always 10% for you, whether you make a million dollars a year or two dollars a year, that, that first section is taxed at 10% no matter what. But what spills over hits the 12. And that section is now taxed at 12. And what spills over hits 22. And that section is taxed at 22. This is the, the visualization of marginal tax brackets. That's what they mean when they say marginal tax brackets. So when you hear my marginal rate is 22, that does not mean that you're paying an average rate of 22. That means that the most expensive tax rate that touched any of your money was 22. But your average was probably closer to like mid-teens, maybe even low-teens, if you were in the 22. Okay, so this right here, those are changing. And, and it feels a little ominous and it feels a little spooky, but um, it's just changing back to what it was. So just going back to, I'll explain that here in just a minute. Um, okay, so in, in 2017, I'm gonna move over here so I can see better. In 2017, Donald Trump passed the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which is a mouthful for me. Um, it, it was designed to reduce and simplify the tax filing process. And it, it, part of the negotiation was that it would expire after 2025. So all, a bunch of things that happened and that we benefited from, or maybe not, it didn't help everyone, but it helped most of us, um, they, they will change back, they'll revert back. So that's what we're, that's what we're looking at right now, is, is what's changing and what's not changing, and so we'll go through some of those things. Um, okay, so we're gonna talk about individuals, we're gonna talk about high net worth people and estate planning, and then we're gonna talk about business owners and what changes you'll see for those three different types of people, okay? So for individuals and just most, most groups in general here, the rates are changing. So this is what it was before 2018. So back in 2017, the rates on the far left is what we had. Now, these were not the exact same dollar amounts. I'll show you that in a second. But the lines actually changed a little bit as well. But on the far left, that was the, that was the schedule of the rates before that. Then in 2018, it dropped by looks you know four three percent for most categories, and and the, but except for the ten percent stayed the same. Now, after 2025, we revert back to this schedule of 10, 15, 25, and so on. 
So for a lot of our retirees, by the way, they, they keep themselves in these first three brackets. Even if you were somebody making multiples of hundreds of thousands of dollars in your working years, I'm amazed at how often we can keep you in the 10, the 12, and the 22, or soon to be the 10, 15, and 25. Um, so it's just because as a retiree, you have more control over what you, sh what you show and how you take money out of your accounts, and Social Security isn't all taxable. This is just a chart to show you for an individual up top and for a joint filer down below. The, the orange line is what it was after the, the T, TCGA was put in place. So the rates dropped a little bit per dollar of earnings. And the blue line is what it was in 2017. We're basically going back to the blue line. So there's actually a section here. If you're a single filer and you are a high income single filer, it's going to get better for you. But there's just not that many of you that are, because retirees, again, don't have to show as much income. But for the most part, the rates do get a little bit higher. OK, so what else changes? So the standard deduction at that time, um, Trump's big thing was he was going to get the whole tax filing process onto a postcard. Do you guys remember this conversation? That, um, and he did, and he didn't. So he did in the sense that he got the whole 1040 on one page instead of two pages. But what they did was they took all of like the wealthy folks situation and moved it over to schedule one. So they just made a new schedule. And then, and, and a lot of people don't have to deal with that schedule one because they don't have investments. They may not have other withdrawals or, or other income from businesses and things like that. And so their tax situation got a lot more simple. So, but you folks in the room are not those people. Think, you know, good for you. You have money and you have investments and you have income. So you probably do have schedule ones for the most part. Um, so it didn't necessarily get more simple for you, but one of the reasons, one of the ways that they made, it, he tried to make it more simple, is he pushed the standard deduction up high enough that a lot of people could just throw itemizing out the window. They're like, I don't have to itemize anymore because the standard went so high. So it doubled, and at that time, it went up to twenty-four thousand for a couple. It, it was twelve, but then they indexed it for inflation as well. So that's why we're now at twenty-seven thousand. So it's scheduled to go back down to twelve thousand, but then inflation adjusted. So this is a guess, looking at about. 13,000 for a couple, 7,000 for a single person. So what that means is you're itemized, more of you are gonna itemize, quite a bit more of you will start to itemize. So a lot of you actually, when this happened, your charitable giving was not impactful for your tax return. It doesn't mean that it, your tax situation was worse, it might have actually improved because the standard deduction was so much higher, but it just meant that your charitable giving wasn't as impactful. So um, another thing that's changing is state and local income tax. This one's really frustrating for people who have a good-sized house and pay a lot of property taxes, as well as a lot of state income tax. They, you can only include $10,000 of that on your tax return. And now that, that will go away. That, that will come back to an unlimited amount. Um, you can now do interest deduction on your mortgage and home equity. Uh, that, that was reduced or taken away. And then the personal exemptions, this one's this one was a big one. When they increased the standard deduction, they got rid of personal exemptions. Um, I had, gosh, when I learned it a long time ago, a professor told me it was the belly button exemption. He's like, you count up belly buttons and you multiply by 4,000. That's how it works. Um, that was just like, there wasn't a good reason for it. It was just however many people you have in your family that you're on your tax return, those are your exemptions and you count them up. All of these are below the line deductions, something to be aware of. Um, what changes for high net worth individuals? And I'm going to keep an eye on this over here as we go. Um, OK, that's a good question. I'll hit that in a minute. Well, what changes for high net worth individuals? This is huge. Right now, people can die. OK, first of all, you know how people talk about, ah, I can only give $17,000 away without estate taxes. And, and they, get, they get really confused around estate taxes. The reality is you can give away as much money as you want as long as it's under 13, basically $13 million per person right now. Now, you might have to show it that you gave it away on, a, on your estate tax return or a gift tax return, but a lot of people don't realize you could give your kids a million dollars right now if you wanted to um, without any estate tax whatsoever. But you'd have to file a gift tax return and claim that you've used a million dollars of your lifetime exemption amounts. And right now, that lifetime exemption is close to $13 million per person. So a couple could give away $26 million and not have to worry about any estate taxes. That number is dropping 
to five million per person, what it was back in 2017, but it will be adjusted for inflation. So I'm guessing six to seven million. So, and, and we have a lot of clients that this just doesn't matter for, and that's, that's okay. But you'd be surprised, especially with home values, right? And so if you have a two or a three or four million dollar, let's call it you have a four million dollar portfolio and you have two million dollars in a home, like I know that's rare, but it happens here in Utah. And so you're, you're also, like I know some people that own a business and maybe they don't make a lot of money, but maybe their business is worth a lot of money. Like those are all things that, that play into your estate and things you should be aware of. Um, so not for everybody, but if it is for you, if it is you, that's a big deal. And the, the estate tax, you're gonna pay like 40% of everything over that line when you pass away. All right, by the way, I think this is one of the main reasons lottery, lottery winners go broke, is because they give so much money away without thinking about the, uh, the, the actual gift tax consequences of it. People, IRS steps in and, and they're like, hey, you gave away $30 million, we need 12. And, and they don't know what to do, because they've given it all away. Um, alternative minimum tax, this is just another way of calculating taxes of government. I'm gonna summarize in a really poor way. I know there's a CPA here, and so he's maybe gonna struggle a little bit with this, but I'll, I'll tell you anyway. Um, my version of this is, the government said you got a bunch of really great tax benefits on a bunch of weird rules, and maybe it was too much. We're gonna calculate an alternative way of doing your tax rate and your tax amounts, and here's another calculation and you may need to pay this other number instead based on getting too many loopholes is the concept. Obviously, that's not perfect. That's a pretty layman term, but that's the concept of AMT. Um, it can be fairly, fairly complex because it has to do with, um, you know, I, I run into it with like incentive stock options and things like that that not a lot of people have. Um, but different phase outs and AMT exemptions um, were increased. They'll come back down and make it a little bit more difficult for those folks. Okay, what changes for business owners? I actually think this is more impactful for um, self-employed people than they realize. So something to really to focus on. The qualified business income deduction was this thing that snuck in, very few people knew about it, even business owners. And then all of a sudden I started talking to people and they're like, my tax bill went down by $75,000. How did this happen? And they had no idea it happened. What happened is in pass-through entities like S-Corps, LLCs taxed as partnerships, um, or just regular old you know, LLCs is how we typically call it, but a partnership, you have business income. And that gets passed through to the owner, and the owner pays taxes on it. Not a C-Corp, that's where you have the double taxation. But what happened was part of this law basically said, great, we're going to let 20% of that disappear as qualified business income, not having to pass through to the individual. There are, I'm simplifying this. There are rules based on how much wages you paid, and you have to be a certain type of business. Unfortunately, Capita didn't qualify because we were a service-oriented business. So anyway, you get, you get the idea, but 20% um, of this just disappeared for a lot of people, and that's gonna go away, and they'll have to include all of it. So if you're a business owner and you've been benefiting from the qualified business income deduction, this could be a pretty heavy increase for you, um, something to be aware of. Okay, so generally, what are we doing about this, and what do you, what do you think about this? How do you think about it, I should say? Good tax planning is done over a multi-year window. Crazy enough, oftentimes good tax planning is choosing to take income now, and so oftentimes good tax planning costs you more today. That's the ironic part about it all. Somebody will say, hey, I wanna save on taxes, and then we'll come in and we'll build the plan, and they actually end up paying more today than they might, than they might have if they hadn't talked to us. So why would that be? Well, if you have a chance to get it out at 10 or 12% today, and we can foresee that you're gonna pay 25 later, why would we not take that advantage of that and take it out at 10, right? So although you might, you might not want to pay much in taxes now, it's a whole lot better than the double of the tax cost in the future, right, in that scenario, right? So good tax planning is moving income between years from high rate years to low rate years. And that takes a little bit of forecasting and variables that you're predicting, and that can be tough. We have software that can do it, and our advisors are really good at doing this too. What are things that you would think about here? Well, maybe you're not on Social Security yet, and you will be. That I, ha I talked to a guy this week that if he converts, he has $2 million in IRA money. If he converts it all, that's all he has, which is a lot of money. I'm not trying to say that's all he has. I'm just saying he doesn't have other tax structures, okay? It's all in money that if he takes it out, he pays taxes on. If he converts all of it 
over to a Roth over a period of time. By the way, you're going to hear on the radio, this is all the buzz to, to convert everything to a Roth. I think it'd be a huge mistake for him to take all that income in one year. It would be at really high rates. That would be an awful decision. But if we, he's, he's in his late 50s. If we can sneak that in in pieces over a decade, and then he takes his Social Security, well, the way that Social Security is calculated, if you have very little other income, oftentimes they don't tax you at all on any of your Social Security. So that guy could have basic, he, we figured he could have he can convert about three quarters of his IRA, take the minimum distribution at 73, and have a zero dollar tax bill from 73 on. Now, we can't do that for everybody, so I don't want everybody to come and to meet with me and be like, you said my tax bill was gonna be zero. But what I'm saying is there's opportunity to think about sh you know, shifting high income years to low income years. So a change in Social Security, that's a change to be aware of. 73 when you have to take minimum distributions, that's a change to be aware of. You're working right now and you might drop, that's a change to be aware of. You're gonna sell a business this year or next year or the year after, that's a change to be aware of. So you're, you're planning ahead probably about five to seven years and thinking about, um, I actually had a cousin who donated seven years worth of, of um, charitable giving on purpose, on, you know, because it was gonna benefit him that much early on and then he had his charitable giving prepared for the next six years after that. So that, that's a way to shift a deduction into a high income year. Oh, let's go back. So I talked to you about Social Security taxable portion. Like that's, we have calculators for that too. So if you're thinking like, okay, well how much of my Social Security is going to be included on my tax return? That's a strategy you can use. The multi-year planning, that's really the overall strategy. That's what you should be doing. Qualified charitable distributions. This is when you take money out of your IRA, but you don't touch it. You have it sent directly from your IRA to a charity. If you do that, you don't have to report it. And by the way, it doesn't show up on the line. The, it's above the line. So if you take that IRA out and put it on your on your own, in your own bank account, and then you send it to a charity, now you have to report it on the line. It may affect your Part B premiums. And then you hope it's more than the standard deduction as an itemized deduction with your state and local income tax and your mortgage interest. But if you just avoid that whole process in the first place and just send it directly to the charity, then you still get the full standard deduction and you don't have to show it on the line. Okay, so that's what a qualified charitable distribution does. Roth conversions, we've talked about that. State and local income tax, I'm just gonna throw this out there really quick. If there, my accountant taught me this recently. If you have an S Corp, um, I'm not sure about LLCs, but there is a way to potentially pay your state income tax through your business and get around that 10% limit this year. Next year, the 10, sorry, $10,000 limit. Next year, that doesn't apply. But just be aware, if, if that went over or past you or around you, that's fine. It doesn't matter, it doesn't apply to you. If it didn't, it, you, it probably does apply to you, if that makes sense. Um, if you have an S Corp and you're paying a lot of state and local income tax personally, there's probably an opportunity for you to help work with your accountant and get a little bit more of a state income tax deduction this year. And then next year, the SALT income limits will go away. Okay, so IRAs, HSAs, 401ks, those are above the line if we can contribute, if we can use those. Deduction bunching, we talked about that. Pulling things forward, pushing things back. A lot of you guys know we use donor advised funds. That's a way to set up a charity account, get your deductions, but still have access to the money to give it away at the time you need to give it away. Um, that's another strategy for that. And a lot of people don't realize there is a 0% capital gains bracket. If you're in the zero and 12% brackets right now, and you stack on a little bit of capital gains on top of that, zero. So oddly enough, there's this weird situation where sometimes it makes sense for us to take losses in your portfolio, tax loss harvesting, to offset gains and purposefully do that. And then, but if you're really low, if you're showing low income, we flip that, it actually could make sense for us to take capital gains in your portfolio and pay zero tax on it. I do this actually with my kids' accounts because you know a certain amount gets at their tax rate, and so I purposefully take a little bit of capital gains at 0% every year. And even though I don't need to, they don't need the money, I'm just selling it, showing the gain, buying it back. Then IRS is fine if you wanna sell and show gains and buy it back, but it's at a 0% rate. So there is a, there is a spot there for a couple, that's about $80,000 of income to 100. Um, if you can sneak it in that with the rest of your income, that's a really good opportunity as well. Uh, that is a quick and, and fast <laughs> summary of what's going on here. Um, let's talk about, 
Let's talk about these questions. So when you say after 2025, are you saying for 2025 tax year? The reason I say that is because I'm talking about it for 2026 tax year. So the tax return you file in the beginning of 2026 is actually the 25's return, right? That will be under the old rules. And then when you file your return for 2026 in 27, that'll be under the new rules. Hopefully that helps. Um, are there any indications that another law will be passed such as that taxes don't go back to how they were? Um, okay, so I just, basically my default for Congress is that they won't get things done. So I would just assume that they're not going to do anything. And the default is that everything will revert back. That's how I do my planning, is if they are in gridlock and can't, I guess I was looking at this just now, I guess Bernie Sanders had to stop a fight. I don't know if you guys saw this. They were calling each other out, like two people stood up. Anyway, we'll get too, too much into politics there, but surprising to me, I'm just counting on them not being able to get a whole lot done. Um, and so that's how I base my assumptions, knowing that if they do change it, we'll change our calculations and we'll, we'll adjust again. That's, that's the beauty of financial planning is that it's always changing. Um, but basically, I haven't heard of anything super strong in there saying that we are, um, we're gonna have relief from this change. Now, keep in mind, it wasn't across the board better when this, when this act came through, and it wasn't you know, across the board worse. My guess, just this is anecdotal from talking with our clients over those years, is that I think eight out of 10 people had a lower tax bill, maybe even nine out of 10, had a lower tax bill in 2018 than they did in 17. Which, if we reverse that, I think eight out of 10 of you might have a higher tax bill in 2026 than 2025. Something to be aware of. Um, and so it, to me, it just means we have to get a little bit more strategic. Okay, on the TV and radio, we are bombarded with ads to invest in gold as a cushion against uns an uncertain economy and market. Good idea or not? Um, wow, this one's good. Uh, gold is tough. They used to, they used to, actually control gold based on, they used to peg it to actual gold and, and they used to control that a little bit better and basically in the last couple decades, the price of gold is basically based, sorry, say this differently. The price of gold is subject to what the person next to you think it's worth, thinks it's worth. So as long as everybody around you thinks it's worth something, I mean, we're not really quantifying the price of gold on its on its supply and demand for its utility. Let's put it that way. Like, we're not looking at the price of gold for how, how much we're gonna use it for gold jewelry like we do for other metals that go into construction. It is based purely on the concept of fear and speculation now. So I'm not saying that gold is bad. It could be a hedge for you. Here are my, here are my hesitations. One, anybody who's talking on the, on the radio to you I've seen commissions of 15 to 30% on the buy side and the sell side of gold. So if you think that you're okay with the idea of buying an investment and having to make 30% in it to break even, then you know, that's, that's, not a, that's not something I'm willing to accept. There are cheaper ways of getting into it. There are exchange traded funds you could buy in your Schwab and TD accounts. Um, we have managers that every once in a while will put small amounts of precious metals and put gold in the portfolio as well. Um, they tend to be more broad asset allocators and not as much like the Alta Capitals of the world. Um, we do have some managers that do it. Uh, but I would not, I personally don't go out and buy from these folks trying to make a commission individual, like actual gold that way. If I want gold exposure, I'm buying it in the portfolio through a fund. And that's not perfectly efficient either because there's a little bit of a cost to those funds, but I think it's a whole lot better than paying crazy commissions. I had this one lady who came to me, she handed me a statement for, and it showed $25,000 worth of gold. It was just like a, a, basically a record keep kept amount that this custodian that she bought the gold through gave her. And she told me, I have another statement somewhere because I put 50 in. And lo and behold, the 50 was the 25. Now, and it wasn't just, and, and frankly, the price of gold hadn't done that. It, it did okay you know, during that time period. It was the cost of transactions. So if somebody's marketing to you hard on it, they are gonna make money because they gotta pay for the marketing of it, right? 
So I'd be careful of those. If you want gold exposure, let's talk precious metals in general, let's talk about commodities in general, let's talk about um, gold as, as an investment. But, um, but anyway, just be cautious about that. Any, any other questions before we move forward? All right, I'm gonna get you through these slides. Those were just in case we needed them, which we didn't. All right. Thanks, Zach. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm getting over a cold. Apologize in advance for any, uh, any coughing. Uh, but my thanks to Zach and to Mike and everyone at Capita for having us out for the partnership with um, uh, OCIO and Orion. Uh, I'm Tim Holland. Uh, the CIO of OCIO, say that five times fast. Uh, I also answer to Tom Holland. And my first experience with gold as an investment was a Love Boat episode. So it was the late 70s, right? Remember Isaac and, and, and that whole crew? And a young Tom Hanks was one of the guest stars. But this was pre-Bosom Buddies, and he hadn't really become famous yet. And his character had made a boatload going long gold in the 70s because to, to Zach's point, gold was pegged to the US dollar 35 bucks an ounce. And then Nixon took us off the gold standard. We weren't really on it in a meaningful way for decades. And then uh, with the stagflation of the 70s, helped along by the big spike in oil and maybe some policy decisions out of the Carter and the Nixon administration that in hindsight weren't so great, gold skyrocketed. So Tom Hanks was this playboy who had made a bunch of money going long gold, and that was his character on, on the love boat. So anyway, uh, that all said, uh, we're going to talk about the US dollar, but we're really going to uh, talk about or try and answer four questions that we've been getting a lot from our clients. Um, one is just on the geopolitical construct. Um, specifically uh, uh, Hamas and the horrific attacks on Israel uh, on October 7th and what that might mean for the economy and, and the markets. Another question is just the reign of the U.S. dollar. Um, clearly our country has some problems right now, economically, politically. Uh, we're looking at an election in 12 months' time that a lot of folks aren't all that excited about, not to get in the politics of it all, uh, but we still print the world's reserve currency. And the question is, well, how long can that last, especially with some of the deficits we've been running and the debt that we've accumulated? Uh, the third question is, are we going to get a digital dollar? Um, there's been lots of talk that the Fed's going to introduce what's known as a central bank digital currency, CBDC. So we're going to speak to that. And then finally, um, how might the election in 12 months' time impact the markets and the economy? So like anything in life, uh, these are all open to interpret interpretation and debate. I'm going to share uh, the thoughts of our team and obviously welcome all questions, comments, um, and any points of discussion. And I know we've got uh, the, the barcode, I think, to ask those questions. So we're going to start with uh, what's going on in the Middle East. And this is a very busy chart put together by a company called Stratfor, and they're global risk consultants. That's all they do. Right? They're really smart folks, and they're just trying to lay out the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians, um, really from a real estate and a military conflict perspective. And I bring this up because it starts in 1516. So I'm not going to stand up here and tell you ha I have any idea how to solve for this or where this is going to go. I, I put this up here because it's obviously been going on for centuries, and there does not seem to be any easy solution. So I'm working off the assumption um, as a concerned citizen and as an investor that Israel is going to do what it has to do to get control of its borders. And we're going to go back to some untenable status quo that no one's happy with. Because I don't know what the alternative is. So I assume that's where we're going, right? So in the meantime, as an investor, as someone who has a fiduciary responsibility for our client's capital, how do I think about this and the portfolios we're responsible for? So if I take a step back and I think geopolitics, typically geopolitics has little, if any, impact on markets and economy, and, and on, on the markets and the economy. Short term, yes. Long term, no. Um, markets tend to respond uh, uh, short term and then absorb the event and then move on, and we'll talk about that. But if there is a transfer mechanism for the geopolitical event, it tends to be the price of oil, right? The world becomes a very unsettled place. Price of oil goes through the roof. And next thing you know, you're looking at inflation and economic headwinds. And that's what we saw in the 1970s, right? You go back to the early 70s, 
the Yom Kippur War, the Nixon administration supports Israel, we get the Arab oil embargo, and then we have what we lived through for the next seven or eight years. This is a look at the US's uh, import-export ratio just going back to 1990, so not all the way back to the 1970s. When the Yom Kippur War happened 50 years ago, the US was importing six million barrels of oil a day, and today we're exporting two million barrels of oil a day. The price of West Texas, which is our domestic benchmark, is off $4 since October 7th. So at the risk of being hard-hearted about this, if this conflagration was gonna have some impact, especially considering it's the Middle East, on the global economy, oil is the most likely transfer mechanism, and it's not happening. Primarily, in my opinion, because we've turned into, fortunately, the world's preeminent energy power. We uh, produce, pull out of the ground, more hydrocarbons than any other country on the earth between natural gas and crude oil. So the hydraulic fracturing revolution, which got going 18 years ago, has left us in an incredibly enviable um, national security and economic security position. Iran's the wild card, most people think, right? Iran supports Hezbollah, Hamas, some other actors in the region. Iran's a net marginal contributor to global oil supply because of the sanctions that have been put in place the last 10 or 15 years. Those sanctions have been tightened and loosened over time, but at the margins, Iran's not the straw that's gonna stir the global oil drink. So again, if there is a transfer mechanism for geopolitics into the real economy and into financial assets, I'd argue it's the price of oil, and oil has gone down, not gone up. Wall Street has a history of absorbing geopolitical events taking them in stride, again, at the risk of sounding hard-hearted, if you go back to Pearl Harbor, all the way to the attack by Hamas on October 7th, what you tend to see is uh, markets either down or up a little bit, short-term, and then up nicely if you look out a year later. What's interesting is the attack, if memory serves, was on a Saturday, October 7th. The market was up that Monday, and one month later, it was up 1.8%. So again, what's going on over there is, is horrific. What happened on October 7th was, was barbaric. But as investors, we have to kind of set that aside and just think about how those events might impact commodities and financial assets. And for what it's worth, the S&P is now up 4% plus since October 7th. So what we thought would happen has happened. Um, and, and our clients' portfolios have benefited for it. OK, the dollar. Um, we have been printing the world's reserve currency really since the post-World War II period, right? If you look at um, Western uh, history in general, or in particular, there have been these periods of handoff where one ascendant power starts to kind of lose their mojo and hands over sort of uh, the geopolitical, uh, the macroeconomic baton to another power. It happened with England in the 19th century, and then it happened with the Eng England, the UK, and us sort of through uh, the 1930s and then really coming out of World War II, where everyone knew, like, you know, the sun wasn't necessarily setting on the UK empire, but their days, best days were behind them, and then we were uh, ascendant. And a French politician once famously said the US had the exorbitant privilege of printing the dollar, right? Because there are other countries and other companies that would love to have more dollars. They've got to go get them. We've got a button, and we can just manufacture them out of thin air. But there's been concern, especially of late, that the US has maybe frittered away this exorbitant privilege. We've done some things from a policy perspective, from an economic perspective, that have put us in a position where maybe this isn't going to persist. And the question really started to be asked, at least by our clients through the summer, when the dollar sold off meaningfully. And so that's the dollar index on the left-hand side. And when that line is towards the top of the graph, it means the dollar is worth a lot more relative to most global currencies. And when it's towards the bottom, it means that the dollar's worth less, right? The funny thing about the currency market is you always own something, a dollar, a pound, a yen, a euro. So if you want to bet on another currency, you have to sell the currency you own. And so as the dollar weakened, people started to worry between that price movement and the deficit that we were going in a bad direction. I'd point out that even with that little pullback, the dollar is still worth more relative to a basket of countries, a basket of currencies, really than at any other point in the last 20 years, except for the peak it hit earlier this year. 
And then if you think about financial assets, the S&P is now up about 17% year to date. Nate talked about a great November. We're up about 9% in the last two and a half weeks. We're up about 17% year to date, easily out distancing developed markets like Japan and Germany and emerging markets on the far right like China. So again, this is all open to interpretation. My crystal ball is cloudy as the next one, but when I think about what things are worth, I think about use, frequency use, and what other people are willing to pay for those vehicles. Okay, so these two rather busy graphs speak to the same thing, which is that idea of use, right? So if something is popular, if something is being used, it has efficacy, it has value, people are willing to invest time and money in it. So bear with me, on the left-hand side is the share of foreign currency debt issuance outside the US, right? So that means if you look at all the countries and all the companies raising capital, right, and what currencies are they raising that capital in? And the blue line is the dollar. And so if you take the rest of the world, and these countries and companies can technically raise money in whatever currency they want, the overwhelming majority choose to do it in the US dollar. The dollar is the world's reserve currency. We have the world's most uh, liquid and the largest bond market, and we have the world's largest and most liquid stock market, and we're the world's most powerful country from an economic and a military perspective. So that makes sense. That number's come down a little bit the last 20 years or so, but it's really come down at the expense of the euro. So the euro, as we know, was introduced in the late 90s, right? You've got the European Union, the European Central Bank. They finally rallied around a single currency. They got rid of the franc and the lira and the Deutsche Mark. Um, so we have lost market share, if that makes sense, but we've lost market share to the currency that's produced by a group of countries that essentially exist under the security umbrella we provide. So a lot of people worry about, say, the Chinese yuan replacing the dollar. Through the summer, there are lots of news reports about the BRICS, right, Brazil, Russia, uh, Iran, China getting together and trying to get the world to do business in something other than the dollar, I'm not really worried about those four countries. And the reason I'm not worried about those four countries is if you look on the right-hand side, again, this gets back to popularity, frequency of use. If you go around the world, say you knock on the door at the Bank of Japan or the European Central Bank, and they happen to let you in or me in, and you say, hey, can I see what's in the vault? Because they've all got vaults. And they're, sure, Tim, come on in, take a look at the ECB vault in Frankfurt, Germany. What do you got in there? They're going to have some gold, for sure. They're going to have some platinum, some silver, some precious metals. And they're going to have a lot of paper money, right? And so if you look at central banks outside of the Fed, right, the rest of the world, and you ask them what percentage of that fiat currency or paper money is in what nation state's currency, 70% is in the US dollar. So again. Our dollar is held to a, a, a multiple of what any other currency is held by other central banks around the world. And our currency is used to raise capital by countries and companies around the world at a multiple relative to any other country. So on the right-hand side, if you look on the far right below the, the, the vertical bars, you'll see the Chinese renminbi or the yuan, and you see where it's represented. It's about a percent. So uh, my personal opinion is, um, you know, our, our primary geopolitical um, 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 foe, for lack of a better term, is China, right? Xi Jinping has ideas of, about getting back to a bipolar world and usurping uh, Western dominance in terms of economic and military uh, um, uh, privilege. Um, I'm not worried about the Chinese yuan replacing the dollar anytime soon. Because I just think about it this way. You've got a country governed by 12 people, really by one person. They change the rules as they see fit, and they could throw you in jail tomorrow if you want, if they wanted to. Would you really want to put money into that country or do business in that currency? So I don't think the dollar is going to get knocked off its perch anytime soon. Finally, in terms of economic might, the US economy is about $28 trillion in total, GDP. Uh, that's nominal. So we're bigger than we were pre-pandemic. A lot of that, Nate was talking about inflation, is because of inflation, right? If the US economy is one pizza in 2022, and that pizza is sold for 10 bucks, and in 2023, the US economy is still one pizza, but that pizza is sold for 20 bucks, well, you just double the size of the US economy. Now, did you really kind of know, because it's all price, but between price and just volume, more goods and more services, our economy is bigger than it's ever been. 
So we're at about 28 trillion, depending on how you measure China, they're 10 trillion dollars in the rearview mirror. And while most folks thought the Chinese economy would usurp the US economy by the middle of the century, uh, most people no longer think that's possible. Uh, they mishandled the pandemic so badly and their demographic profile is so awful um, that the line around China is, um, it's gonna get old before it gets rich. Like they sort of missed that window. Uh, and then on a per capita basis, if you saw for population, we're $80,000 per GDP. So that's at 28 trillion divided by 330 million. China, which has four times as many people as we have, uh, closer to $14,000. So we've got our problems for sure. Um, but if you think of the size of the economy, uh, the breadth and depth of our mar the breadth and depth of our markets, uh, including the stock market share uh, the U.S. holds relative to the rest of the world, no one comes close. So if you took the U.S. stock market, if you took uh, the U.K. stock market, uh, the, the bourse in Germany and around the world, and you put them all in one pie, um, we'd be 40% plus of that total pie. And that reflects the fact that love them or hate them, if you think about companies like Apple, Meta, the old Facebook, uh, Amazon, um, uh, Microsoft, uh, Apple, I mean, you think about the companies that were set up in the last 20 or 30 years that have literally changed the world, they're all US. What China tried to do was just replicate those platform technology companies, as they're called, and it didn't work. They essentially stole our best ideas. So, um, you know, nothing lasts forever, but, uh, at least as I sit here today, um, there is no uh, a credible, viable replacement for the U.S. dollar. Uh, it could happen someday, but if, if that day does come, it's decades away. Okay, digital dollar. Um, this is purely hypothetical because we don't have a digital dollar. Um, Joe Biden, President Biden, signed an executive order a couple years ago directing uh, the government to look into the feasibility of a digital currency, which got some folks worried that uh, we were moving to a digital dollar, right? And without getting into the politics of it all, I think, and not to speak for anyone in the room or anyone, excuse me, across this great country of ours, what people worry about in terms of a digital currency are a couple things, but maybe the biggest point of concern is programmability. So if you talk digital, uh, central bank uh, digital currency, CBDC, right, possible though currently non-existent di existent digital form of the US dollar issued by the Fed, you know, we have credit cards and PayPal and Venmo and all of that. So people ask, well, what's the difference between that and these payment mechanisms and platforms and a digital currency? And they're similar in that they're, they're digitized and there's sort of an ease of use and efficacy and speed to it, but they're very different because if I send, you know, Zach 50 bucks via Venmo, Zach's still gonna sort of cash out that 50 bucks on the other end. Right or PayPal, or if I pay a credit, if I use my credit card and I have to pay off uh, that credit card bill, at some point, real dollars are going to make it into uh, um, um, uh, the bank that Visa uses that you know Wells Fargo is going to send that money to. So there's still you know uh, paper money underpinning the entire system. The thing about a digital dollar is that goes away, right? And what worries some people about that again is the idea of programmability. So we have federal uh, programs. Uh, social programs that uh, issue cards to, to, to families and adults where they can only buy certain things with those cards, right? You can walk into a store, you can buy vegetables, you're not supposed to buy beer, right? You know, how tightly some of that is enforced, I don't know. So think of it this way. Um, you get rid of uh, a debit card, uh, you get rid of cash, and you just have an app on your phone, right? And you go in and you want to buy a pack of smokes or you want to buy a gun, right? Not to get into the, in, in, into the Second Amendment, or anything like that, and all of a sudden you go to pay it, and because that digital asset or digital currency is programmable, it's programmed not to allow you to buy what you wanna buy. So that's what really disturbs some people about the idea of central bank digital currencies. You can literally, because it's all digital, uh, you could program what you could or could not do with that money. Um, the amount of power it would give the Federal Reserve over a banking system over which it already has tremendous power would be that power sort of times X, right? Now there are upsides to, to, to going to a CBDC for, sh for sure. Um, you could offer banking services to the unbanked. You could um, um, take two, three, four period, uh, day period settlement periods and sort of make them instantaneous for sure. Uh, but again, the loss of individual freedom or the ability for federal authorities to sort of coerce certain behavior 
um, for a lot of people outweigh any potential benefits. So, you know, that's sort of a CBDC at a high level. Um, as we know, the, con uh, the Federal Reserve is answerable to Congress, right? Uh, Jay Powell, the chair of the Federal Reserve, has said we have no plans on uh, going down this road anytime soon. And even if we wanted to, we couldn't do it without Congress saying, do it. So that could change under a different chair of the Federal Reserve, but the current chair of the world's most powerful central bank has said, even if I want to do this, I can't because I need Congress to pass a law. Zach was talking about gridlock in DC. This is a pretty contentious issue, as you might imagine. I can't imagine uh, under this administration or maybe a Trump administration, given that you're gonna have a pretty split Congress, anything like this is gonna get done anytime soon. So we've gotten a lot of questions about uh, a CBDC. Again, it could come, but if it's coming, it's years and years and most likely decades away, but uh, most likely um, um, not in our lifetime. Okay, the election. Um, so we're a year away. Uh, what's interesting, if, if you kind of, before looking ahead, we kind of look sort of uh, present day and, and backwards. On, on the left-hand side, we just plot out the price return of the S&P 500 going back 60 years. And what's interesting is in the third year of the president's uh, term, it's known as the presidential cycle on Wall Street, seems to work every three years. People can't really figure out why. I've got my theories. I'm sure Nate and Zach and Mike and, and the rest of the team at Capita do as well. Um, markets just do really well in the third year of a president's term. Doesn't matter if it's a Republican in the White House or a Democrat. And what's interesting is with a really strong November, um, uh, we're having so far sort of knock on wood, the s and is up about 17% year to date, and on average year three gives you 17%, which is a pretty meaningful uh, uh, um, amount of outperformance considering that over time the S&P gives you eight or nine. So again, we've got our theories as to why, we can talk about it, but so far that's holding. The other thing that's interesting is um, there's been a lot of talk and anticipation of a recession this year, at least as of now, the economy's proven to be remarkably resilient. Um, we've never gotten a declared recession in year three of um, the presidential cycle. So we've got six weeks left to go in the year. Um, I still think we're going personally into a period of economic weakness next year. It doesn't look like it's gonna show up until 2024. Uh, what's also interesting though is if you get a recession next year, every time you've had a re recession in year four of a president's term, either the incumbent or the incumbent party has gone on to lose the election. Right, so think George Bush, obviously he couldn't run, but John McCain did. Think George H.W. Bush in 1992, and obviously the recession that we brought upon ourselves by shutting down the economy in response to the pandemic and President Trump uh, losing his bid for re-election. So if you're the Biden administration, you're praying and you're hoping and you're gonna do everything you can to make sure the economy grows next year. Um, the other thing that's interesting is we're a year on from midterm elections and the market's up nicely. The markets have never been down 12 months on from a midterm. Again, there are theories as to why, but the political calendar is this pretty neat, pretty fascinating, somewat uncanny uh, canary in the coal mine vis-a-vis -vis future market performance, and all the past patterns are holding. Okay, so let's talk about the election a little bit. I am a political junkie, though I am no political scientist, uh, and I'm not gonna break any news right now when I say I'm assuming it's gonna be President Trump versus President Biden in, in the mother of all rematches, right? Uh, and I'm also assuming, um, um, I was, I don't know if I should joke about the first Gulf War, but I was talking to someone about the first Gulf War, and if you remember Saddam Hussein promised the West the mother of all battles, if you remember that, and the, I used to read the Far Side cartoon, I don't know if you guys have ever read the Far Side, and there was this great cartoon where there are a bunch of guys in braids and military uniforms sitting around and planning a big conference room table, and a guy walks in with a huge pizza, and the, and the tagline is, who ordered the mother of all pizzas? So anyway, 1993, give or take. Um, so I assume it's gonna be a coin toss. Uh, there's been lots of polls out lately, including the New York Times Siena College poll that showed President Trump winning five of the six swing states that most folks think will decide the election. Uh, we're a year out though. Uh, so I assume it's gonna be President Trump, President Biden, I assume it's gonna be a coin toss. I'm working off the assumption Joe Biden wins a popular vote just because of California, New York, but that there's obviously a very good chance President Trump gets the White House back because he wins the Electoral College. But I assume it's gonna be super close and it's gonna go down to the wire. Uh, then we have Congress, right? So on the left-hand side is the current breakdown between Dems and Republicans in the Senate, and on the right-hand side, 
uh, the current breakdown between Democrats and Republicans in the House. So uh, Democrats control the Senate by the thinnest of margins. Republicans control the House by the thinnest of margins. Uh, what's interesting, you probably read that Joe Manchin from West Virginia is not going to run for re-election. Um, there is talk he may run as a third party presidential candidate. Uh, West Virginia is a state that Donald Trump's won by 40% uh, twice. So odds are you can kiss that Democrat, Democratic seat goodbye. And so the odds of the Republicans taking the Senate just went up meaningfully. Right? And on the right hand side, uh, there have been some redistricting decisions at the state level that make it more likely the Dems actually take the House back. Again, this is all conjecture, but I'm just trying to make the point that it's super close in Congress, both houses, and odds are, you know, one party's going to control one uh, um, uh, end of things and the other party's going to control the other end of things. So, why does that matter? I mean, ultimately, fundamentals drive uh, the market, interest rates and earnings in particular. Uh, the pullback in bond yields, the, the end, hopefully, of the Fed rate hiking cycle are meaningfully, meaningful positives for stocks. But if you tie it all back to the political calendar, the political dynamic or construct, on the left-hand side, if you go back a very long ways, when you've had divided Congress, a divided Congress, and obviously one party's got to hold the House, uh, the S&P does really well. Right? And again, there are theories there, uh, the most um, accepted being that um, the markets hate uncertainty. It's a bit of a cliche, but markets don't like uncertainty. And so Zach earlier was talking about gridlock. And so if you know the Republicans hold, say, the Senate, the Democrats hold the House, and Donald Trump is uh, president, you know, odds of anything big getting done are pretty low. So if odds of anything big getting done are pretty low, the odds of a big policy surprise are pretty low. So if you're a CEO, you can go run your company and you don't have to worry about DC changing the rules. So we're a long ways away from the election. Um, who knows where all this lands in 12 months time. But again, I'm not the brightest guy in the room. I'm pretty sure we're gonna have a divided government. I'm pretty sure the market's gonna like it. So. Um, these are my parting thoughts. We've already talked about all of these, but again, Wall Street has historically shrugged off geopolitical events. So far, at least, that's been the case. Uh, we are the world's largest uh, producer of hydrocarbons. Again, the hydraulic fracturing revolution was just that, a revolution. Um, I can't imagine where the price of oil would be if we were still importing six million barrels of oil a day. So you know, my thanks to all those wildcatters in Texas and New Mexico. Um, the dollar may lose. Uh, uh, its status at some point, but most likely not in our respective lifetimes. A digital dollar can only happen with Congress and whoever sits in the White House ordering the Fed to do it. Those odds are pretty low too. And my best guess is the next 12 months are going to get pretty bumpy uh, just from a political and cultural perspective because again, we've got a rematch uh, coming down the pike that is going to be bumpy and probably pretty uh, nasty and pretty intense. My best guess is divided government's the most likely outcome. The market's like that for sure. The other point I'd make is that we're in a new bull market. Uh, it may not feel that way given all the volatility in August, September, and October, but we are in a new bull market. And if history is any guide, new bull markets tend to become old bull markets. They tend to run for three to five years. We're about six months into this one. So fingers crossed, it's been a bumpy two, two and a half years, um, but we should be uh, all things being equal in a pretty good spot going forward from here. So I'll stop there. Uh, thank you all for your Tim, time. Tim, we do have one question. Much. Can I throw it out to you? What's that? A question? Yes, Is that please. okay? So you already talk, touched on this a bit. Let's just have you maybe expand if you feel necessary. Yeah. A lot of chatter that the yuan will go on the gold standard, and that would make it the reserve currency of choice. Feels like fake news. Your thoughts? Um, China could do that. I don't think China can do that. Um, I mean, China, so if you go on, the, so, so the idea about the gold standard, right, sort of the convertibility is from a macro perspective, um, it limits the politician's ability to spend money, right? If, if a dollar is convertible into a, a, a specific amount of gold, well, you kind of need more gold if you want to expand the money supply. China's in a really bad spot demographically from a debt perspective, from a real estate perspective. Um, and, and their market, their stock market has been just absolutely on, on, on the back foot for years now. They could do that if they wanted to do that. One, they would need to hoover up, as they say on Wall Street, a ton of gold, right, to sort of create that dynamic. But it would also limit their ability in a very meaningful way 
to um, um, enact expansionary, inflationary monetary policy decisions because they'd be handcuffed by the convertibility dynamic. So if you're Richard Nixon in the early 70s and you want to take the U.S. off the gold standard, um, which you know happened about 50 years ago, you know, it, there's something very freeing by, about the idea that you mean we can spend as much money as we want as long as the bond market allows us to spend as much money as we want. So I don't think they'll do it because I think it would limit their ability to deal with an economy that's just still struggling in a very meaningful way. Um, even if they were to do that and, and sort of the yuan took on additional credibility because of that, you know, the, the amount of yuan in circulation uh, uh, the, 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 the liquidity in that market is a fraction of what you see and experience every day with the U.S. dollar. So again, currencies you know, are essentially a bet on a nation state, on a government, on an economy, on a rules-based system. So you know, I, I, I may be biased, but I think about our country, and I know we've got a ton of problems, but you know, and I'm open to debate all these, we treat capital pretty well. We let money come and go as it wants. Uh, we don't tax at usury rates. We uh, respect uh, um, private property, physical and intellectual property. Um, we have uh, the world's largest, most uh, liquid capital markets. Uh, we have a judiciary system most people trust. There's not a capricious dynamic to it. And even with all the things I see on college campuses right now that I'm personally not thrilled about, we're still home to the world's greatest universities, right? And so we have a checks and a balances system obviously in place that prevents any one entity from accumulating too much power and then tipping the scales into dictatorship and obviously the rule of one or two or three. In China, you have a Politburo, a 12-person committee that governs a country, but it's really one person, and they essentially can do whatever they want. So how confident do you feel that you're going to take a billion dollars, put it in Yuan, put it in that country, and you feel like you can get it out whenever you want, at however you want? And I just think until that entire construct changes, the geopolitical risk around that currency is just too great for people to ever do meaningful, meaningful business in it. I mean, I'm not saying other countries won't and, and they don't, but I just, is Western Europe gonna go down that road? No, is Japan? No, they're scared to death of the Chinese. Is Australia, New Zealand? No, or is Canada? No, is Mexico? No, um, I, just, I just don't see it happening, so. Perfect, thank you. Thank you for coming, everybody. We sure appreciate it.